six three F Y. I'm getting to the point where I'm gonna have to start wearing cheaters or something, but I've made it this far. Uh, in this instant case, the defendant is Trevor William Eugene Hewitt. He was charged with domestic violence and attempted resisting or obstructing a police officer. He was placed on probation and Daniel Frazine is his probation officer. The case took a while. We had some forensic center examination and some other matters. Uh, Mr. Frazine has prepared a probation violation allegation and a status report. The allegation is that you violated your probation by failing to pay fines and costs, failing to abstain from the use of drugs or alcohol or submit to a test on demand, failed to participate in treatment program as directed, and failing to abstain from assaultive or threatening behavior. Uh, this was originally set for Wednesday, August 30th at 9.30, but I had to move it because I have to be gone on Wednesday, so it got crammed in here. Uh, the defendant pled not guilty Wait a minute, is this, is this just an arraignment? I thought it was the actual hearing. Let me look at this. No, it is a hearing. Uh, Mr. Hewitt pled not guilty to that petition. Daniel, is this an arraignment or the hearing? Should be the hearing, Your Honor. All right, that's what I thought it was. And that's why it's I asked Deborah to join us. Moved around. So yes, it got moved around. All right, anyway, the allegation and any one of these could be a basis for uh, a probation violation, failing to pay fines and costs. That's the one I'm least worried about. Failure to abstain from use of alcohol or drugs or test on demand, failing to participate in treatment and failing to abstain from assault or threatening behavior. Those are the ones that are cause for concern. Uh, Mr. Gibson has discussed this with his client. At this point, Mr. Gibson, you've advised that your client wishes to have a hearing regarding this? Yes, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Frazine, why don't you come right up in the witness box. Please raise your right hand. You swear or affirm any testimony you're about to give in this matter will be true to the best of your knowledge and belief. I do. Thank you. Uh, Prosecuting Attorney Deborah Davis has joined us. We all have benefit of the status report. Mr. Davis, Ms. Davis, could you inquire as to what caused Daniel to file this petition? Sure, just briefly before we get that started, I just wanted to make it clear that it's my understanding from Chief Assistant Prosecuting Attorney Josh Robert that there is still an open and active abuse neglect case with Mr. Hewitt. So the testimony that's taken today um, by Mr. Frazine will certainly impact that. So I wanna make it clear so that there's no question later about this that um, Mr. Hewitt is aware that this is sworn testimony. All right. Mr. Frazine, um, could you state your full name and spell your last name for the record, please? It is Daniel Frazine. Laura, we're actually taking testimony here now. F-R-A-Z is in zebra, I-N-E. And you are a probation agent for the 3B District Court here in St. Joseph County? That is correct. And is Trevor Hewitt one of your probationers? Yes. And on that probation, um, you had filed a petition alleging some conduct, correct? That is correct. And we'll go with the first um, allegation of non-payment of his fines and costs. Can you explain that to the court? Um, well, he's placed on probation on January 11th of this year and is now almost, we're almost in September and he has paid no money towards his fines and costs thus far. And I did check that this morning and that is still correct. How much is due and owing? Um, well, all total, if you were to go for full term, which would be the total two years, uh, which most people don't do, it would be $1,235. Through August, I have a total of $535. Okay. 
You said five hundred and five dollars. Yes, after you deduct net oversight fees. Okay. Uh, have you had contact with Mr. Hewitt about this deficiency? Yes. Tell me about that. Um, he well, right from the get go when I met him at jail and I did this uh, the PSI on this. He had had a plate in there. Um, I was just going by what he disclosed to me, obviously, um, which was re related to, or maybe it was some screws, but it was a work-related injury. So when he got out and was, um, he did call me when he first got out of jail, and he said he had to um, tend to that and get with his doctor and surgeon and see what was going to do in it. That did take a while to get that resolved, the issues with his leg or ankle. Okay. You also alleged that he failed to abstain from the use of alcohol or drugs or submit to a test on demand. Can you give specific about that? Um, mostly that has to do with the lack of money for testing. Um, I did get it one test and he was positive for marijuana. But um, when was that? was that test? That was on 7-19-2023. Everything else was negative other than the marijuana. Is that the only test that he has submitted to upon request? That is correct. And how many times had you requested where he refused? Well, there's two that I officially sent him, but there were many times I just said, and I suppose if I sent you today, you wouldn't have any money. And he'd say, yeah, that would be the case. So there was two that I officially had sent him. And he refused that. Are there options for those who cannot afford to test? If they are working with county mental health and services, then there is grant money that I will pay for the testing. Did you advise Mr. Hewitt of that? That is correct, I did. And when did you tell him that? Uh, I tell, tell him that right when they're uh, their intake for probation. Was it recommended that Mr. Hewitt go to get some mental health services? My understanding is not only did I recommend that, but also with um, he's involved with CPS um, and through them, they were also uh, recommended. And I do know that he had talked to um, uh, Heather, who was an infant mental health specialist, who's um, probably dealing with the stuff I'm guessing that's going on with the um, child, the child that is in service, foster care services. And your notes indicate that that was back in um, February 2023 with Heather from CMH. That would be, yeah, that was my original conversations regarding that. I left work. Okay. To your knowledge, did Mr. Hewitt ever follow up with community mental health or what's now known as Pivotal that provides the mental health services for the no, county? Nothing up for himself. Just related to CPS is my understanding. And what was his reaction uh, when you talked to him about testing uh, versus having it paid for if he's in counseling? Mr. Hewitt is, uh, he can tell you what you want to hear quite often. And I also know that he was struggling, so he was given a lot of slack, or I don't know if I really want to call it slack, but a lot of understanding. Plus, he did have the issue with his foot, so he didn't have any money. So that is a tough thing for us to get services for people, but he did have county mental health available to him. So I tried to have them avail that. Did he admit to any substance use? Um, he, had, he said he had a, a past history of it, but... He overcome most of that except for the marijuana. Your other allegation from Article 9 was failing to participate in a treatment program as directed. Is that the CMH treatment program? That, that, you're talking well, about? that was the um, domestic violence. And tell me about that. Um, uh, you have to pay for that. Um, so I referred him to that. And originally, I think when we started, I think it was. Um, K, I think we were doing working with KPEP, but then um, Kalamazoo OCC makes it where you can just pay. I want to say it's thirty. Initially, I think it's thirty-five dollars for the first class, and then I think it's fifteen or twenty after that. So you pay for each class, and then you have a you have to do twenty-six classes. 
Did Mr. Hewitt complete any of those classes? No. Did Mr. Hewitt talk to you about uh, any options to assist with payment on that? No. And at this point, he was living where, if you know? He was living in uh, various places that changed from time to time. Do you know what his income was? Well, until this was filed, um, he, he didn't have a job. He talked to me he was going to go work. For, last I knew he was going to work for a trucking company called Rural. But then after I filed this PDA, I found out he was working at Fawn River Kayak. And I did speak with them. From that. At the time, he did have employment there. I'm sorry. Can you explain that? So he did have a job throughout the pendency of this? Uh, when, well, no. Um, when I called them at the time of this arraignment, I believe he was working there, I think they said, for about a month. Do you know how much he was making there? No, I do not. I did not ever get a pay stub. And how did you know he was working there? Uh, I found out once this was filed and he brought that up and then I called them immediately after to confirm it, obviously to check out the veracity of the statement because I didn't have a pay stub to verify any employment. So they confirmed that he was working there. He was working five to six days, mostly six. So he had some form of income? Yeah, he had some form of income. I don't imagine it was very high paying, but. So you have no idea? But I have no idea. And you had said earlier this injury was a work related injury. Was he getting unemployment? He was not getting that. And he told me he was uh, having trouble with the workman comp and dealing with the workman comp. It was having to do with tra tra uh, trailer factory. And they were like, fighting his workman's comp and he was having difficulty, but he wasn't getting any money from him. That's what he told me. So last I knew. So how do you know how he was surviving financially day to day? Well, eating, for for a while he was in jail. So but after, um, he was out of jail. And after jail, no, I do not. Barely. Your other allegation is that he failed to abstain from assaultive or threatening behavior. Can you explain that? Um, Yes, I had gotten a police report. Um, this one is dated uh, July 6th of 2023. Um, the officer noted that he had gotten called out to um, the residence of Carly Harmon. Um, Which officer is this? Which agency? Oh, Hop Hopkins. Hopkins. Uh, okay. Sturgis PD. Okay. And what did Officer Hopkins have to say about? Well, he was calling, or he responded there with a complaint from Mr. Harmon, um, who complained that Trevor had burst into the house, uh, grabbed her keys. She wanted them back. And in the process, he had punched her. Uh, the officer did note that there was some redness on her arms. Photographs were taken. Um, at that time, the officer know that according to Ms. Harmon, she said that he was homeless. Um, she said there was a no contact, but there was a no, not a known con contact listed. And on the probation order, it just says that he cannot reside with her. Um, so that was obviously great. The officer asked her if she wanted to press charges. She said she felt that... Um, she has to in regards to this domestic issue, and I don't know what a 48-hour form was is, but a 48-hour form was filled out, and when I checked this morning, there's nothing further on this, so I'm guessing nothing came of it, but there, my understanding is there is a PPO violation that's being filed as of 8-12. Um, a lot of the stuff that's really concerning to me is I spoke to um, CPS and to um, infant mental health, and they have it that he's made numerous threats, and some of them are um, threatening to um, suicide bomb the courthouse, um, threats against the fake ass judge Kevin Kane. Um, the infant mental health had asked uh, Miss Harmon if she thought he could 
would ever kill her. She said she doesn't think that he would want to, but she could definitely see him doing it. Um, but do you know when these statements were made? No, but it was after the time of the probation. I, I asked Heather that, but there were various dates. I guess they're made quite often. And she said that she had warned him several times that she had to take notes. She was a mandated reporter and that she could never recommend reunification with her child while he's making such comments. And he said the he report understood. says they were April and the beginning of May and then another one in early July. And I guess they were, I mean, they were frequently made um, to the fact where Chelsea from uh, CPS stated that she'd only do video um, court hearings or hearings because of the uh, fear for her safety. Um, and the mental health stated that she wasn't quite as afraid because she had a um, duress button and she would never meet him in person or any at his house or anything like that. But as long as it was at um, now pivotal CMH, um, and there was some place where she had a, like a dress button because she says he can be very charming and can be very well presented, but he can go off and make some very <coughs> nasty comments and very threatening comments and did multiple times about um, taking out everybody who was involved in this case and burying them in the woods, stuff like that. So it's very concerning. And that's my, the main issue I have with this is because a lot of the other stuff about paying money and stuff like that, we deal with on a regular basis, but we're on for a domestic violence like this and we are, keep doing stuff like this, going to the houses and assaulting people. It's very, very concerning. And Carly Harmon is the same person that he assaulted to get onto this probation, correct? That is correct. And Kevin Kane is the magistrate, the referee that handles the abuse and neglect case regarding his That's children? my under understanding. Is there anything else regarding the allegations in the petition that we have not covered that you would like the court to know? I have one. Um, didn't CPS offer to pay for the domestic violence group? Uh, at one point they had made that, yes. But he said he was correct. moving to Detroit? Yes. So they didn't actually end up paying for the domestic violence class? Correct. That is correct. So the two people that gave you that information were Chelsea Meyer from CPS and Heather Allen, or last name. DeCastro? Yes, that's correct. All right. And she is from CMH or Pivotal. Yes. Anything further? No. No further questions. Mr. Gibson. So with regard to the payment aspect, I guess I just want to get it clarified. So are you saying that um, Trevor Hewitt did not make any payments toward the money he's supposed to pay when he was on probation? That is correct. And so the amount of 555, that's what you're saying he would owe, I guess, if his probation term was cut short? Yes. Okay. If I've done my math correct, that is correct. Because we don't charge them for the time that they are not on probation. So it sounds like a lot of the times when uh, maybe the defendant didn't test, did the defendant, did you discuss things with the defendant and did he in a sense admit that he had been using and so in a sense he didn't test because you thought that he would end up be positive anyway? No, he'd always say that he would have no problems passing the test. He just said that he didn't have any money to test and obviously we can't just take people at their face value. We have to have confirmation. So on one of the days that I think that you indicated in your summary that Mr. Hewitt was not going to test. It looks like that he ended up maybe contacting you later in the day on July 19th, but he had actually gotten a ride because uh, it appears that earlier in the day you indicated that you had contacted him and that he didn't have any way to get the testing. But I believe that that's the one positive test he did have was 
July 19th. Is that correct? And Marina, that sounds correct. Yeah, Carly came and got me. Okay. So in that, would you say that on that day, maybe he did in a sense, it may have been a few hours later, but he did actually end up testing, even though originally it was going to be a failure to test. Yeah, he did test on that day. That's correct. Okay. One day you were requesting me to. I thought we were doing really good, Dan. Now it looks like on June 30th, um, I believe that might have been a day that, is that a day that you said the defendant was asked to test and he didn't test? What day is that? Uh, June 30th, 2023. I think it would be on. I have the down to refusal, yes. Okay. Now it did say in the report that um, defendant called and said that he's going into treatment today because he is struggling with sobriety. So, Although the defendant did not test that day, he admitted to you that he was struggling with sobriety. <clears throat> yes, he said he was struggling uh, as far as cravings, but he didn't say he did not say that he's been been using other than the mar marijuana. Did the defendant indicate to you that day that he was going to Coldwater Psychiatric Hospital? Did he verbally tell me that? Yes, he did verbally tell me that he was going to go. Yes. Do you know if the did you ever follow up to to be able to determine if the defendant actually did go to Coldwater? I, they are advised they have to give me any paperwork, sign releases, and I have nothing to corroborate that he went there. Okay. Mr. Hewitt, I'll give you a chance to give your side of the story, but just stop muttering over there. It's going on the record and you're not under oath and uh, I'll give you a chance to tell me whatever you want to tell me. So with regard to the assaultive or threatening behavior, uh, I would assume that you're saying that you are um, your knowledge of these threats is, is based upon what other people told you, correct? That is correct. What I have in a police report and what other people who are um, reporters, okay. mandated reporters have reported to me, yes. So would you, although I under, I understand that the, the violation would be, quote, you know, assault of or threatening behavior, um, and, and the word assault or assaulted has been used today uh, quite a bit. And I guess, would, would it be fair to say that the conduct that he was accused of was threatening people? Um, and that, in a sense, you're not aware that, I guess what I'm trying to clarify is that, you know, it's, it's really threats because I guess, um, I guess I'm not aware of any accusation that he committed a battery or some type well, except of... Except for the actual physical assault on 7-6, which the police said that, Carly said that he punched her and then they took pictures of a uh, red sore arm. That okay. would be actually physically assaulted, but okay. the rest of them would be verbal. The re okay, the rest were verbal. Okay. Do you know if there's any new criminal charges that uh, that the defendant may be facing based upon as of this morning. Uh, the only thing that I am aware of that is currently going on besides the probate issue is a PPO issue that's coming up. And it was filed on 8 12 of this year.
All right, I have no further questions. Thank you. You can step down. Um, Ms. Davis, you have any other proofs? No, Your Honor. Mr. Gibson, does the defendant wish to testify? I believe so. Absolutely. Now, Mr. Hewitt, why don't you come up to the witness stand here? Please raise your right hand. You swear or affirm any testimony you're about to give in this matter will be true to the best of your knowledge and belief. I swear. Thank you. Please have a seat. Mr. Gibson. Is it correct that you were placed on probation on January 11th, 2023? That is correct. You understand that you're here today because the probation agent has indicated that you have failed to live up to the terms of probation and have violated the terms? I'm you understand that? I'm accused of, yeah. Okay. So, with regard to the payment of fines and costs or financial obligation, do you recall making any payments to the court uh, during the term of probation? No. Now, uh, were you employed during the entire term of probation? No. So, uh, is it correct that when you first got on probation, you were still, uh, I guess you could say, injured and maybe not released for work because of a prior work accident? That is correct. I had a titanium plate and eight screws in my left foot. Got removed in May. In May of what year? This year. Okay. So until that stuff was removed, were you available to work? No. So once you were cleared to work, did you uh, make efforts to find employment? Yes. And when did you begin that process? Uh, immediately shortly after I had the plate room. Okay. Had a three week healing process. And so probably either May or June of this June, year. Yeah. And then did you get a job? Yes. And where was that at? On a retirement. So do you, when do you believe you started working there? Well, I'm not really sure. That was just like a spur of the moment kind of thing. I can't remember the day I started. Okay. How long did you work there? Up until the date of the arrest. Oh, so if not for your arrest, I'd you would be be still be working there? You I think? got arrested in a Fawn River kayak shirt. Okay. How much were you being paid at Fawn River? $10 an hour cash. Okay. And you were working a lot of hours there? seven days a week from eight to six and Saturday and Sunday I'd work until nine. Okay. Really a quarter to eight, every morning. Did you tell your probation agent, Dan, about the job there? Yes. He confirmed it. My boss, Jeff, came to me and I, he, he told me that somebody named Dan called and asked if I worked here. And he said, yes, I worked here. And that was it. So do you recall that at times during your probation, you were asked to submit to a drug test? Yeah. There was one time when I was living in the Meyer parking lot of Three Rivers, and I had told him that, you know, I'm barely... Uh, getting by right now. And he said, I understand that. I believe it was excused. The one time that I was available to, to test, I was at work and I had to talk my boss into letting me leave. He had to run into town. And when he came back from town, he let me go. And did you test that day? Yes, sir. Do you remember what the date was? No. Last month. So was there ever a time that you were asked to test and that you told Dan you couldn't? Because of financial ability, the one time. Did you, was that a day that you told Dan that you were struggling with sobriety? Possibly, yes. 
when you would tell Dan that you were struggling with sobriety, would you give him any more details, like admit to using controlled substances? He wouldn't ask. He didn't ask for specific details. My point of view was Dan was really, I don't know, I thought, I thought I was doing all right, man. We had a lot of conversations about his house being built by Champion Home Builders and me working for Champion Home Builders and stuff. So. Do you recall uh, an incident where you were accused of going to the work of Carly, and that you were accused of threatening her at her work. And what day would that be? I believe it was at Applebee's in April. Top words, dispatch, please help me. Um, it was in the end of April, beginning of May, 2023 at the Applebee's and Three Rivers. Do you recall an accusation that you had threatened Carly that day? No, nothing about threatening her. Uh, went to her work one day and, uh, she snatched my key fob out of my truck and ran inside. My truck was basically stranded outside of Applebee's until one of her coworkers called the cops and the cop came and made her give me my key back after running the tags and the registration on my truck and it coming back into my name. He came out and said, it's obviously your truck. And I said, yeah. Did you go to Applebee's to see her that day or did you just happen to be at Applebee's? Of a request from her to go pick up food, probably. She fed me. She worked at Applebee's. She gave me food. Since you were placed on probation, have you threatened Carly Harmon in any way? Absolutely not. Were you ever physically assaulted toward her after you were placed on probation? Absolutely not. There's an allegation that she was punched in the arm by you since you've been placed on probation. Did that occur? That's the, the, today is the first I'm hearing about that. I never talked to Hopkins about that. I've had quite a few run-ins with uh, Detective Hopkins. And that wasn't one of them. One since I've been released from prison was a Tiffany situation. Neither were here nor there. My phone number hasn't changed since I've been out of prison, though, so I would I think it would be very easy for the Sturgis Police Department to hold me. Do you re do you, you're accused of threatening DHHS staff or pivotal staff or making threats uh, um, in their presence? Do you recall that? Last year, not since I've been on probation, though. No. I haven't really had any runs. So you have. So. You don't, you don't, did you make any threats since you've been placed on probation to anyone from the DHHS staff or Pivotal? Absolutely not. I've had one meeting with Heather since I've been on probation. And I haven't talked to any other CPS workers or anything. I haven't communicated with any of them. Do you recall that you were uh, asked to participate in a treatment program as part of your probation? Yeah, the DV class. Did you participate and complete that? No, I had numerous occasions where I talked to Bill from the DV class and it was it was arranged eventually. Every single penny I've been making has been gone to Carly. She wouldn't have her apartment if it wasn't for me. I paid for a deposit on her apartment. I paid for everything. I paid for gas to get her back and forth to work. I paid for gas to get her to her drug testing. I paid for everything. So no, I haven't been uh, financially able to pay for anything. She wouldn't have her awesome apartment for them. Now, 
It's indicated at, in the, the probation agent says that at some point during your probation, uh, you had indicated that you were going to be moving to the Detroit, the Detroit area. I did. Okay, so Sterling Heights. when did you move to Detroit? I don't recall. I just packed up my stuff and left. And that was during the term of probation? Yes, sir. Did you let your probation agent know? I believe maybe. I don't remember. Okay. I don't believe I had any intention of ever coming back, so more than likely not. So how, how long were you in Detroit? Over a month. And then you did return? Yeah, sadly. So at the time that you moved to Detroit, your intention was to stay there and never come back to this area? Yeah, get gainful employment because they have a champion home builders like 15 minutes away from where I was staying in Sterling Heights. Did you make any steps to start uh, a probation transfer or anything along those lines? Wasn't there long enough. Okay. Now, uh, on or about June 30th of 2023, it was alleged that uh, you had told your probation agent that you were going to the Coldwater Psychiatric Hospital and uh, that he told you when you get there to sign a release. Did you go to the Coldwater Psychiatric Hospital? Yes. I'm not aware of any release, though. Did Were you there then? Did you spend time there? Yes. How long were you there? I don't know. Two weeks. Did they uh, recommend any follow-up treatment? Yeah. Have you been uh, participating in that? I haven't been able to. I was scheduled to go to CMH on the 24th of this month. Okay. My doctor was transferred to Blake Weimer and LaGrange, and I was scheduled to go to CMH on the 24th. Got food stamps started in LaGrange, got all sorts of cool stuff. So this was all going to be in LaGrange? Um, yeah. But as Dan told me that we have some sort of like a 20 mile radius or something that it was still able to be there because it wasn't a certain range away from it or something. I can't remember what it was. So I didn't feel like I was breaking any laws by being on the range. So do you believe that you can continue this probation and complete your probation? If given another opportunity, absolutely. I mean, the job is probably in question, but. Is there anything else that you want to say in defense to this probation violation accusation? Uh, I thought I was doing okay, man. I was slow rolling it. Obviously, I had some issues to begin with, you know what I mean? The, the surgery and everything, waiting for that to heal up and uh, then trying to find gainful employment. I kind of lucked into the Fawn River kayak job, but yeah, I was looking into the rule. And uh, I had to stay clean for 30 days before I could pass a piss test to, uh, I mean, a urinalysis, I apologize, a urinalysis to uh, get a, a CDL, DOT policy. So I was kind of struggling with that, but then I locked into the job in front of a kayak and a buddy of mine had the job and he couldn't do it because of his injuries and I could so is your in your injury now is fully healed that you had had surgery for? I don't know what capacity you would say fully healed, but uh, yeah, I mean, I was working, I was pulling kayaks up a steep hill and I was driving a van and backing a trailer into a driveway and I was taking people, dropping them off and launching kayaks down the river. I enjoyed my job and I did a very, very awesome job. According to my boss, really liked my you know, work ethic. Okay. Didn't have any issues working. I don't have any further questions. Ms. Davis. Under the circumstances, I'm not going to ask him any questions at this time, Mary. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hill. You can step down. Anything further, Mr. Gibson? No, Your Honor. The defendant 
was placed on probation in January. Uh, it was a large block of upfront jail time. This was originally charged as a felony, I believe, uh, resisting and obstructing and the domestic violence. Um, as Daniel indicated, the probation hasn't gone very well. Some of it was the defendant's physical limitations and some of it is just his state of mind. Uh, there is a PPO in effect. It was issued by Judge Pattison, I believe, and there's a hearing coming up on that. And the defendant is credible in some regard that she keeps contacting him, but he's clearly aware that the personal protection order prohibits him from having any contact with her because he knows he was contacted by the police. They didn't do anything, which they should have lodged him right away. So he continues to have contact violation of the PPO. Judge Patterson will deal with that at the PPO hearing. He was given a hundred and 12 days jail, I think. And he's got another 16 under his belt now. He hasn't tested. If he'd gotten connected with community mental health services, they would have paid for the testing. He hasn't done the domestic violence class. CPS was willing to pay for the class and he didn't cooperate with them. So they didn't pay for the class. Um, Time frames are unclear. He went to Detroit for a period of time, which I'm not sure we even knew that. Then he was in the hospital for some period of time. I believe he was. I don't think it was weeks, but we never had a release. So we can't just call him up and say, hey, what happened here? They won't disclose any of that. Uh, then at some point he starts working. Um and I'm not sure that we learned about it till after the fact. So he didn't pay, which is the least of my concerns. But we had the opportunity for someone to pay for his testing, but he didn't cooperate with CPS. Or he didn't cooperate with CMH, now Pivotal. We had someone that would pay for his domestic violence class, but he didn't cooperate with them. Um, he continued to violate his personal protection order. And it's alleged that in July that he assaulted Carly Harmon. This is a probation violation hearing, and it's a somewhat strange proceeding in that, one, hearsay is admissible. Uh, the rules of evidence don't apply strictly to a probation violation hearing. And two, the standard for the burden of proof is lower than a conviction. It's lower than proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a preponderance standard, I believe. I believe it's more than probable cause. So I don't have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you violated it, and I don't have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt uh, through direct testimony. The hearsay is a little distant. It's secondhand hearsay. Daniel was told by somebody who may have been told by somebody but they're clearly afraid of you, CMH and CPS. Um, but I think your representation of some of that preceded the probation is probably accurate. Um, basically, once you got out of jail, we haven't accomplished very much and you've been sort of on your own program. Uh, the recommendation was to just revoke the probation and close and Pose the balance of jail. Um, I guess some of the PPO facts are going to come out in the PPO hearing. Ms. Davis, do you have any further recommendation? Your Honor, I just <clears throat> wanted to point out that in my notes at the time that he was sentenced on this and placed on the probation, the court was concerned about his ability to um, behave himself, I guess, basically, that there was concern about lifting the no contact, but that Ms. Harmon wanted the no contact lifted. That being said, 
that doesn't give him free reign to have contact with her if there is some other order of another court, whether it be the abuse and neglect court or whether it be um, Judge Patterson's court through the PPO, which was issued according to the court records on 7-11 of 23, which would have been after this incident um, that's alleged on 7-6 of 23, um, which was not ever turned into our office to review for any charges. So I was not aware of it until today. Uh, but certainly the incident that that's alleged for August uh, for the PPO violation, he is certainly aware that, that there was that. And, you know, his behavior before being placed on probation with CPS and with Carly and with, you know, Heather DeCastro, yes, some of that probably was before, but he earned it. Um, and then after, since he's been out, he's continued and it sounds like escalated his assault over threatening behavior. Um, you know, with Mr. Frazine, he's been uh, verbally abusive. You know, we're all, we're all adults here. We can, you know, take words. Uh, but his behavior is not that of somebody who wants help. His behavior is that of somebody who wants to make excuses and make himself look like he's in the best light, that he's, you know, giving all of this money that he's making to Carly. Well, it's his own testimony is that Carly is also gainfully employed. Um, so, you know, he wants to put himself in that victim role that he doesn't have the money to test and he doesn't have the money to do this because he's just giving, 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 giving. But in reality, uh, if he is doing that, his priorities are, are out of line and he's being assaulted and threatening and abusive in doing that. Uh, so it's, it's certainly not helping his overall situation. And if he would take the effort to get into the DV class that would be paid for by CPS and get into substance abuse counseling that would be provided uh, by CMH Pivotal, he would learn these things. But he's not ready to learn these things. So at this point, I would ask the court to impose the balance of the year. Um, part of the reason I did not ask him any questions is because ethically, I don't feel it's appropriate because there is that PPO violation. And the notes in it when I pulled it up are that this probably should have been sent up as an ag stalking, um, that sort of thing. So he may have more charges coming his way, but he was given the option for probation with the knowledge that the recommendation was going to be a lot of jail if he didn't take this opportunity to better his situation, and he didn't. So I'd ask that the balance of the year be in, in, imposed. Thank that you. is true. Uh, there was an understanding that there was a lot of jail hung over his head. Mr. Gibson, what's your thought? Well, the, the defendant, to my knowledge, has been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, and that he does have, you know, genuine mental health issues or concerns. Uh, it's my understanding that he he did have a forensic evaluation. He indicated that he had been diagnosed with mental health uh, problems and that he was on medication. Uh, one aspect of this case that made, I believe, things a lot more difficult for the defendant was that he had suffered a work-related incident accident prior to the arrest for this case. And so he was trying to uh, go through rehab and uh, he had, it's my understanding, he had gotten addicted to painkillers as part of his, uh, the injury that he suffered. And, you know, that, so he was dealing with a lot of stuff going into this probation. So, you know, I would ask the court to take all this stuff into consideration, you know, because the defendant has, um, you know, he has considerable jail credit. Uh, he served considerable jail time before he pled, he pled in this case. So I would ask the court to take that all into consideration as the defendant uh, has made definitely some efforts here, but he was dealing with a lot. Um, he, he had a lot that he had to deal with that most the typical defendant wouldn't have to deal with recovering from a very complicated medical surgery and those kind of things. So thank you. Can I speak again, Your Honor? No. That's what your lawyer's job is. Um, the defendant is intelligent. 
but he does have mental health issues, but he's a gaslighter. He's making other people look like they're crazy and he's not. Um, that they're at fault and he's not. And uh, he's pretty good at it. And uh, I don't know what Carly's circumstance is. I think there's some credibility in the defendant's statement that she's voluntarily having contact with him in violation of her own PPO, which certainly doesn't help her abuse neglect case. Um, defendant did some things, other things he did. First of all, I do find that the prosecution has established that the defendant has violated his probation. He's failed to complete or even start any of the treatment that was offered to be paid by CPS. He's failed to test, uh, and some of that was offered to be paid for by Pivotal, if he'd, Pivotal, if he'd gotten involved with the CMH, but then he did at some later point. There was this incident in July. I don't know why it didn't come in as a criminal complaint. I think Ms. Harmon was not cooperative. And I think that uh, you can have looser rules of evidence in PPO hearings and probation violation hearings than you can in a criminal matter where it requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so I don't know what to make of that. Daniel's just saying, let's just put him away as long as possible and then he gets out. Not sure I like that option either, but I don't think I'm going to be any more successful this probation later than I am now. He has 112 days plus 16 days, uh, which is 128. I'm going to order 180 days credit 128. Leaving, what is that? 52 days minus good time. The probation is continued. I can always revoke it or close it later. Because I want a better plan. I want a release. I'm willing to get off your back, Mr. Hewitt. But I'm not just casting you to the winds without any sort of plan. Um, so we'll address this further. Uh, we'll see also what happens with the PPO hearing. That could be up to 90 days. You do have some credit. And uh, we'll see what we can get with Lisa for some sort of CMH treatment. All right, you're free to go. Thank you, Anna. Deborah, I have another tough case uh, that you don't know anything about. So I should sit back down. Mr. Hewitt, I mean. Uh...